Hello everyone and welcome back to my JNSQ series in Kerbal Space Program 1.7.3. In this episode, I have put in the newest version of Kerbalism, Kerbalism 3.3. So hopefully that will solve some of the science issues, we'll see. Uh, somebody also said that I should change the DSN modifier in the advanced section of difficulty. Uh, so this uh, to 4.0 for JNSQ, so I guess we'll go with that for... Um, well, I can't quite hit 4.0. I'll go with 3.87 and hope that's the best. That's for the best. Uh, I don't know if I should change the range modifier on this one. Um, if you know whether I should, please tell me. I didn't actually uh, look into that. So anyway, the SN modifier has been changed to that. And let's take a look at some of the Kerbalism things. Lifetime radiation is still off. And we've got... Um, Transmit science immediately, analyze samples immediately. So I guess that was what was the problem. And we have all these notifications, which I'll probably want to turn some of those off. I'm going to turn off electric charge right now um, because, yeah, uh, that'll happen a lot, I think, otherwise. I'll leave it on for now. We don't have that many probes. Later on, I might change my mind. Okay, so... That is some of the suggestions, but there was also the suggestion to ditch the heat shield on that returner vessel that we splashed down with. Let's see if it... it's still there, so let's take a look at it. We could recover it now, actually, you know? Actually, uh, from the tracking station, I don't even have to make it float up. I could just recover it right there. Uh, but, alright, let's take a look if releasing the heat shield will allow it to float back up. Okay. Well, it's still sinking. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of... Uh, there's this uh, calm thing. I don't know what this is. This is new. It's science archive thing. Okay. That's different. Anyway. Um, oh, we don't have communication. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, so we can't test it like that. So we'll just recover it via the tracking station. It's sort of cheaty, but... Tracking station. Sort of cheaty, but we'll take that into consideration in the future. Let's see, uh, we got six signs from it and got some funds back. Actually, uh, this is so long that I can't see what the percentage is because recovery base at KSC Runway is taking up so much space in this dialogue. Well, anyway. So let's take a look at the tech tree. So we'll research general rocketry. There's a lot of engines in here. Now, given the sheer number of engines we have unlocked, what I want to talk about is making a judgment about which ones to unlock. After all, with all of these, I don't want to spend all the money to unlock all of them. So what are the qualities I look for? Well, holy... Uh, well, a 419 vacuum ISP will certainly attract my attention. Uh, but this is hydrogen, so and I don't know how they've implemented hydrogen here compared to real fuels in realism overhaul, so it does depend on how that's all done in this situation. Uh, but a 316, uh, well, look, taking a look at the engines we have right now, we've got a 285, and that's an upper stage engine. Uh, we've got the swivel, which has 320, so we got to take, but that's a first stage engine. And then we've got uh, this solid rocket motor. 287 is a pretty good vacuum ISP, though. Much better than the stock ones. And otherwise, they're in a 270 range. So this is our best vacuum engine right now, basically. And this is our best sea level engine. We really need a better vacuum engine, is what we're looking for. So... 316 vacuum, but this is a 140 kilonewton engine. It could be used in vacuum, but it's uh, probably too big for our kinds of rockets right now. We're looking for something like the Terrier in the sort of 60 kilonewton range. Uh, 30 to 60 would be fine. Uh, maybe even less like a Spark would be fine too. So we're not looking for these right now. Uh, though uh, the Hunter engine here uh, is basically a 1 kilonewton thruster in my mind. Uh, except that might be a vernier. Oh, it's a vernier. Oh, 304, 37.5 kilonewtons. Well, that's certainly better than this one. 
So we'll keep the Hunter in mind. That's about the kind of engine we want. So I have to scroll down to find the actual engine, it looks like. This is uh, 5.75301. Not really what I'm looking for immediately, though it might be for a pod uh, that comes back, it might be a retro engine. I mean, I don't see a real point in having this uh, descent booster unless I'm deliberately uh, recreating Mercury. This is the Mercury descent pack. And so that's the only reason we would want to use this one. 308 is pretty good. This 10 and 88.7. That's a little bit too powerful. Really, these are three variants of the same engine. And it looks like it's the LR91 from the name. See, LR91, that's the upper stage engine on the Titan rocket. So we know what that is now. And on, in general, though, I don't know if uh, that little bit in the name tells us what the stuff is. This is an LR87, so, okay, that's the first stage engine on the Titan rocket. Um, and there's a pair of them. They actually only ever came in pairs. Yeah, the Merlin 1A is actually not that good in this context. Not one when you have the swivel. This is good. This Decker. 311, and it's 38 kilonewtons. That's about what we want. 4 degrees of gimbal and 5 degrees of gimbal, depending on whether we're talking about the Vernier or the the main engine. So Decker is good. Uh, these, these are solid boosters. The Star 37s. I mean, yeah, so compared to the Hunter up there, that's just a 304. But what's the cost? And now that we've got sort of We've narrowed it down to like three or four candidates, um, the cryogenics included. The 0.35 tons for 37.5 kilonewtons. Here, much less mass to give us more thrust. Well, that's interesting. Cost is 480 for the Decker. Cost is 460 for the Hunter. But still, I think the Decker is a much better deal with such a light mass. Yep, I'll go with this one. Okay, let's take a look at just changing out uh, the upper stage engine on one of our rockets with the Decker and see what effect it has. Oh, this is interesting. Um, apparently, Returnal 1 had a warp fixer module. That must be from Kerbalism. That's the only mod I changed. And I guess they dumped the Warp Fixer module now. But we'll just ignore the Warp Fixer module. Hopefully that is not a problem. Okay, so here we had a Hadar. That was uh, this one, which I had previously pointed out. And I only had 285 vacuum ISP. Let's make sure that we're looking at the vacuum delta V here. 2,555. We switch out the Hadar, which is really heavy actually, but it has some monopropellant and all. And we put the Decker instead. 2,503. So this 2,503. This was 2,555. The what? <laughs> uh, but that's because it's containing more fuel. It's got liquid fuel and oxidizer. So we need to sort of compensate for that. 1,802. So it's not a huge di uh, difference when you look at it. But it is a difference that could be the difference between getting to orbit or not. Now... Apparently we've got engine burn times and ignition limits now in Kerbalism. I did not anticipate that this would be a thing, but now it is a thing. Uh, so, but at least it's generous. Five ignitions on the swivel, uh, 17 ignitions on the Decker. Under normal circumstances, that would be quite enough. But the burn time, 5 minutes and 50 seconds, is rather tight uh, for something with 17 ignitions. We'll have to think about that. Uh, so right now this is uh, quite more than we need for this payload to get to orbit. Uh, but we've already done this payload. What we really want to know is, can we build a rocket that would launch a Kerbal to orbit with just our current pad to orbit? And in this case, with this Mark 1 command pod, I'm a little bit worried with the unpressurized thing. So we might have to unlock this Vinci command pod, which uh, costs more, but it looks like it is pressurized. It's got pressure control here and all sorts of other uh, fiddly bits. Um, I don't know how long it can keep a Kerbal happy. 
we'll see. I mean, crew report takes four minutes to transmit, interesting. Uh, there is also this personal re-entry capsule, and it's got pressure control, and it's really light. Um, it says it can be launched into low carbon orbit on a Bossart. I don't know what a Bossart is, but okay. Uh, less habitat volume, so the Kerbal's not going to be thrilled. I, I think we'll just uh, unlock both of these and see. Let me put together a quick rocket and see if it's possible under 18 tons to get a Kerbal into orbit. Okay, so the Bossart is apparently the Atlas rocket. And if you wanted to make a full Atlas rocket, first of all, the regular Atlas, Atlas rocket wouldn't have a second stage. And it would have one of these balloon fuel tanks, BT-6500, uh, this BT-4-2200. Probably, normally, it would also have um, at least another one of these, if not um, a 1200 like this. And so, but that'll, uh, the reason I didn't have that, whoops, is it goes over mass. And uh, you would probably want a skirt, which I have unlocked. Uh, even though I probably don't need it. This is the booster skirt. This is all from BDB, of course. I don't know why it clips in there. Seems like the node's in the wrong place or I'm missing a part. Um, not too sure what part that would be since the... Or uh, maybe there's a particular engine that's supposed to go here. I see. Uh, so if we have the specific engine that's supposed to be on this system... This is for the booster skirt, this buzzard. And then this vulture... The stats are exactly right though for the center engine on the Atlas rocket. So I'll unlock it. And just to, just to see... No... Nope. Uh, so it's not solving no problem, so maybe there's another fuel tank or something. I really shouldn't have unlocked it, it's not a useful engine in this context. Um, there's probably some mount or something in here to account for the fact that this is attaching wrong. But anyway, this is the Atlas rocket. And, well, it yields some interesting results. If we drop that, and we bring back our second stage engine, and uh, this is reasonably efficient. This engine has five ignitions, standard. And so, yeah, what we get is, if we go to Vacuum ISP, 5,735, which is enough to get it to orbit, but the swivel does not have enough thrust at sea level. Just a little bit shy, 0.97. And if we take a look at our mass currently, we need 0.4 tons. We, well, we don't need 0.4 tons. We have 0.4 tons left. Now, on the pod, then this is the larger pod. Uh, we've got a blade of heat shield here. Leo, it's supposed to be for, for the Leo, and but is it this Leo? I guess so. Um, and I mean, I wish it would also have said in the description it's for Da Vinci pod, but all right. So anyway, Leo system. We've got the pod. This is the full size pod and the parachute. I don't know if the parachute's good enough. It should be set to a higher pressure. Mm, about there. And it says that we've got, I've only got put one Kerbal in there right now, a Jeb, and five days of oxygen, lots of nitrogen, food, and water. So we're good on the supplies for orbit. And there should be enough left to bring it back down, if we could uh, actually get off the pad with this. Uh, so right now we're 0 0.123 tons, and if I empty that, uh, so that's... 2.5 tons of fuel and this particular tank is only 0.125 tons in mass so that's a 5% uh, dry mass to the fuel mass and that's way less than the normal for Kerbal Space Program so I mean of course that's because it's a balloon tank and that's true of the Atlas rocket the Atlas rocket had these balloon tanks that were extremely light, which allowed it to launch a person into orbit on Mercury, uh, despite only having one and a half stages. So that was one of those things. And it was much lighter than the R7 style rocket that launched the Vostok. But yeah, I don't know how cheaty this is at this point. Basically, I'm going, hmm, 
Uh, should I take advantage of these balloon tanks? Well, I mean, in real life they did. And what about the lighter pod? This Hermes. Would be, we be able to use that effectively? Taking a look here for a single Jeb. Uh, two days, two days, and plenty of nitrogen. Stress is fine, and um, habitat is okay. So yeah, I mean, I don't see any barrier to using this. Okay, so now we've got this little Hermes capsule, and I've changed out that tank to be a better fit to it because it's uh, thinner than the other capsule. I still got the Decker engine here, but now we've got uh, enough mass room for two of these swivel engines. And that allows a sea level thrust weight ratio of 1.9. And yet the vacuum uh, uh, delta V is still 5,730. So, and we're still under the cap just by a hair. Now, do I want to risk a Kerbal on this is the question. Um, contract wise, you know, we've all we've got is put a Kerbal into orbit for 30 days, but this can't do that. This cannot do that. I feel like I would rather test the thing uncrewed. And we haven't really recovered something properly yet. Let's take a look at the contracts before I commit to this, but we'll call this uh, Atlas 1. We've got an explore the moon contract. Possible. Fly by the moon and gather scientific data from the moon. Well, I mean, I don't know how long, how much delta V it takes to get to the moon, but maybe we could try that. Okay, I've decided that our best choice is this little pioneer probe. That's what it is. And it should have enough range for the moon. I haven't actually looked at where the moon is yet. And we've got tons of delta V after unlocking this chrysalis engine. Uh, it is only a 5.75 kilonewton engine with a 1 kilonewton vernier system and pretty light, so that's beneficial. We're just using one of the old Vic Loon tanks. We've got some solar panels on the side with the batteries and uh, yeah, we'll just put a fairing around it. This assembly together is 0.4 tons, which is less mass than the pod, but it might be a good first. Uh, maybe we'll put some extra mass on somehow. I think maybe just having to lift the fairing along with this would be enough burden. We'll see. I don't have FASA in here, but apparently BDB has the FASA launch clamps included. Okay, so will this be a good mission for the moon, or will it fail? I guess we'll find out. I overwrote the other Atlas one, but it's fine. Let's see. Whoa. Very washed out look today. Okay. Let's see, where is the moon? Well, it's right there. Hmm. 88,000 kilometers. So, actually... Hold on a sec. Let, let me go back to the Space Center. Let me check on that antenna range on the Pioneer. This says 63.2 thousand kilometers. So we have to put something else to help it out. Now, I thought I had some sort of antenna range helper thing, but I don't know how to bring that up. Let me bring back the one outside right now and I just slap some of those on. We could try that. Okay, so I slapped some extra Commutatron 8s on there. Oh, we can't really poke through like that. Um, well, anyway, you'll have to trust me that they're on there. Apparently, the map view is where the antenna helper is supposed to be. There's supposed to be an icon somewhere. Uh, I don't see that icon. <laughs> so, hmm, maybe I'm missing something. All right. Anyway, throttle up. SAS is on. We have SAS. That's always good. Uh, 90 electric charge. We'll see. At least we have the solar panels. I don't know if they'll be enough. I didn't even think about that. Let's launch. I you know, would dearly like some help controlling this wild beast. 
Now, if the BDB parts make it easier, I still don't feel like I'm in a very good financial position. And part of the reason is just having to unlock a lot of parts to figure out what they do and how they'll work out. The engines I can figure out pretty easy, easily, but the, but the tanks are not necessarily entirely clear to me. Woo. Uh, I should throttle down more often. <laughs> uh, I forget that I can do that sometimes. That's something Kerbalism hasn't changed. Okay, well... We need an engine to keep control. I'm gonna dump the fairing now. Very nice. Got a decoupler there, thank goodness. Let me extend these Commutatron 8s before I forget. And taking a look at map view. Um, well, I still don't see an icon for that antenna range thing, so... Guess we'll have to see whether the antennas are additive or not. So that's the question, whether the range of these antennas, which say it says combinable, is really combinable with this one. And what the actual equation is. If it's anything close to what I think it should be, it'll be alright. Now the inclination of the moon is still just flat, it's equatorial, so we don't have to do anything funny to get there. I wonder if the... Now, we, we haven't unlocked the tracking station or flight planning or any of that business, so I wonder if the over the horizon trick will work, like it does in stock. Is this good enough to Kerbal rate this rocket? Perhaps. Okay, well, that's a little bit lopsided, but got lots of Delta V left. So we can't actually target the moon. We're gonna try the stock thing of waiting until the moon is right over the horizon, see if that's gonna work here too. Guess I'm sort of relying on the fact that we could eventually see the moon, but. Is the glare of the sun so strong and the moon so shadowed that I wouldn't be able to see it? Well, there is an alternate way of going about this. And that's just burning up to a lunar orbit, lunar orbit. Oh, there's the moon. I think. Uh... Thought I saw it. Thought I saw the moon. I think we're gonna go with that theory. And we'll figure it out later. Oh. oh, I wasn't responding to my throttle for a sec there. Okay, off we go. We're just gonna lift the orbit up to lunar orbit. And we'll see how much that costs. We had 1,200 in this stage. Okay, and we're starting with 3,700 here. Okay, just a little bit past the moon's orbit, and that should be fine. So, we took about a little less than 300 here. So, we could estimate 1,500, let's say, to get to the moon. Again, I'm not consulting the Delta V chart, though in this case that would be fairly accurate. Uh, whatever it says on there, there's no reason for it not to be accurate in this case. Um, where it wouldn't be accurate is when there's an atmosphere involved and gravity losses, or uh, when there's a huge inclination or eccentricity. But in this case, the moon is in a perfectly circular orbit still, and not inclined, so whatever the delta V chart said, that would probably be right. It's also good to know what the trip time is. If we send a Kerbal, we need to make sure we have supplies and everything, though I wouldn't expect to pack so little. Well, 60, 50, okay, maybe I didn't overshoot that much. Okay, so obviously we are way ahead of the moon right now. So we are going to do something about that. 45%. 
So that's that's not too bad. We also seem a little bit above the moon. It's a four day journey and I think we've got 12 hour days now. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lift my orbit beyond the moon's orbit as if we were rendezvousing with a target vessel. This would be the equivalent of trying to match velocity. That's a heck of a sound. Oh my god, it blew up. Gosh darn it, Kerbalism. We'll have to check what the reliability of this engine was. Engine blew up. Hmm. This could be a problem. Can we do, like, reports? Well, whatever we're transmitting is taking a, a more electric charge than we can supply with this battery, so that's important to note. I mean, the solar panels. Eventually, this would hit the moon. Hmm. And you know what? Getting the money might be more important than getting the data. We could wait. We're on a safe orbit. As long as we're not in like some sort of ratio to the moon's orbit. Eventually we would hit the moon. Can we like not transmit the data? 11 bits, bytes, 11 bytes per second. Okay, we've stopped transmitting now. Okay, and we're replenishing electric charge. All right, let's see if we accidentally fly by the moon. <laughs> oh, oh, we got it, we got it. We're gonna crash into it. Well, uh, too bad we didn't have an impactor contract. But let's see. So we fly, we've done the flyby. We just need to gather some science, but can we? Or will we not have enough electric charge? Well, let's try... Let's just try the... Well, photograph... We really want photographs. This is what this probe is for, photographing the moon. It's a heck of a photograph, though. It's all in the dark, but by the time we get into the light, it's not going to... Why can't you just stop rotating? Um, it's going to be dead, so... In fact, I don't know if we can transmit it in time before we crash into the surface. Which, you know, we should just be transmitting a whole bunch along the way. One hour and 43 minutes, T minus, it says. Uh, I can't tell how long it's going to be before we crash into the surface. No storage space. Okay, I maybe delete the file. Delete it. Delete that file too. We can get Kerbin anytime. We have not gotten any... It's going all intermittent on us and... I don't know if we're going to get it or not. Seems to require nine hours or more. I, we probably don't have nine hours. We got a little bit of data. I mean, because it was at 13.5 and now it's at 14.1. But this contract didn't satis uh, get satisfied. Gather scientific data from the moon is not satisfied by it. So maybe I pushed that engine beyond its burn time by throttling down initially. I think that might be what have what might have happened. After all, if it's gonna blow up before its burn time, there's no point stating a burn time. So it must have gone past its burn time. The point of the burn time is that that's how long it's guaranteed to actually work. So through much testing. I guess we have to transmit the entire package before it's going to be satisfied, but I don't think it's going to go fast enough before we crash into the surface. Well, how does the moon look? It's a lot more bumpy than I would normally expect. Hmm. Well, there goes that probe. Oh, okay, I see now. So there's this data capacity thing that I can increase. And we will need to do that. And I still don't know if 2 megabytes has got to be enough, but it would be better. But 
I guess we're gonna try and launch a Kerbal now. Um, I don't know how easy it is to get new Kerbals after we kill them. They seem rather expensive. I, I don't know. This seems worrisome. I hope this Hermes pod is uh, up to the task. We've got a problem with the pad because we've got these launch clamps. Well, I guess we'll try and have it stand on the swivels. What can I do? So, to review, uh, vacuum 5,800 meters per second. This will be Atlas 2. 2. And I am nervous as all heck. Uh, we're gonna have Jeb try and do the thing. Okay, SAS on. Throttle up. And we're not gonna wait around. Uh, electric charge 140. And ticking down, but probably alright. Alright, launch. Uh, wow, it's not really holding. Maybe I shouldn't let Jeb steer. I don't I don't feel like he's doing a good enough job. Let's have Mech Jeb steer. We don't want to incur too much heat. I'm worried about the parachute on the nose. I'm going steep. That's intentional. Okay, towards the dawn. Is it the dawn of a new age for Kerbals? Okay, separation. They're gonna have limited... Oh, there it is. I was going like... Where's the limited ignition? Remaining burn. 5 minutes, 8 seconds, 7 seconds, and ticking down. So we'll have to watch out. Let's just pin that. Okay, the sun's there. Okay, engine shut down. We have enough for return. And we should get a world's first out of this, surely. Hmm, I haven't cleaned all the other ones up. Not getting a whole lot of bang for our buck out of these. No, I, I didn't see a world's first. It doesn't have a first Kerbal mission separate from first probe mission, unfortunately. We got 3 minutes and 38 seconds left and 60 ignitions, so that should be fine. Okay. So, well, uh, we can't EVA jab, I believe, yeah. So, uh, just a crew report. We can't recharge, we're gonna have to worry about power. I don't want to auto transmit. Okay, yep, we've got a properly stored crew report, good times. And everything else is looking good, except for electric charge is going to diminish eventually. Um, I don't know if we're going to go for a Vostok style orbit, or whether we can do more than one orbit. We don't have any solar panels or anything. And it looks like we will need to go ahead and come down on the next orbit. I mean, on this orbit. So, let's get rid of that. Orbit retrograde. I'm worried about splashing down though. I can decouple the heat shield, but I can't guarantee it's not going to sink. I can barely see the land or where it is. Well, we have good ignition. And that'll bring us down somewhere. Hey! Separating the service module. Got to retune the chute here. I suppose with Jeb inside I can manually deploy it at the right time and not pre-deploy it necessarily. Um, I don't have an option to stage the heat shield. I should have done enable staging in the VAB or shouldn't have have an option to stage the heat shield? Uh oh. I'm a little bit worried now. 
I mean, there's usually a discard option for heat shields, but it doesn't seem to be in this case. Should I trust Jeb to hold retrograde? He seemed to wiggle a lot before. There is the parachute down option, I have to remember. If all else fails, we'll do it Falstock style. Not a whole lot of countermeasures for mountains except for just making sure you don't land on them. I don't know the geography of this Kerbin. That blader is going quite quickly. We really need all of it on this heat shield. Oh, this is a cloud layer, yeah. But there seems to be some land underneath. Maybe. Okay. I'm gonna give myself some decision time parachute. Now let's see, above ground level. Some sort of deserty place. And we are at 4.8 meters per second. Seems okay. Jeb barely breathed during this orbit and did not take any food or water. It's been less than an hour though. Okay. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> that is a relief. But I feel a little bit iffy on the use of balloon tanks at this stage. The engines are fine. Actually, I mean, this engine uh, on the upper stages, and Jeb got some extra experience and some Final Frontiers ribbons. Very good. But yeah, I mean, the upper stage is not anywhere near like a uh, Terrier or a Spark. Spark is 320 ISB, Terrier's 340, uh, 345, 345. Uh, this one is only 310. Was it 308, 311, somewhere around there? So, engine-wise, it's not uh, off the rocker, but the question is, let's say we replace this tank with an uh, equivalent uh, normal tank, but then vacuum delta V, well, you know. <laughs> okay, maybe the balloon tanks aren't so great, uh, unless these are also weird. I don't know. I have to recall what the ratios were. Maybe these are also lighter than they're supposed to be. So I don't know, I'll get your thoughts in the comment section about the use of these tanks, which are not really stockish tanks, I guess. Yeah, they're not really stock ratio. Unlike the SSTU tanks, which we will eventually unlock, um, those will should maintain the stock ratio. But I don't think we have those right now. We have a whole lot of other tanks though, but it's gotta be complicated parsing through all these, trying to decide which ones have the right ratio and which ones don't. This one's very suspicious. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I don't wanna have to like make a list of approved tanks or anything. Maybe we'll just go with it. I mean, it's not like they're paying us a whole lot, right? I mean, and we're not even getting anything special for launching Kerbals instead of probes. We could launch probes all the way. Well, there is that one contract for putting a Kerbal in orbit for 30 days, but otherwise, yeah. So, maybe it all balances out in the end. Anyway, uh, I'll get your thoughts on that, and I think this is a suitable achievement to end on. So, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.